kidding me? So, I got a question some time ago. And it was, why do you have so many decks? How many do you have? 14? Why do you have that many? Well, um, that's a kind of a complicated question you got there. So, to put it simply, here are possible answers. First one, one could be a collector. And the list goes on. There's nothing wrong with collecting. If you like it, well, have at it. Then there are some that actually go at it like I do primarily, as I like to collect them too. There are some that like the idea of having multiple decks because each deck depicts a card differently. Okay, for an example, we'll go with the Nine of Swords. Pretty standard. This is the Beginner's Guide to Tarot by, I can't remember her name. Okay, typical Nine of Swords. As you can see, the individual is like, oh gosh, I can't sleep. She's having nightmares, and if she puts her head any higher, she's going to get the back of the head. And then there's another depiction like this. She's like, oh gosh, I'm having night terrors or whatever the stir like the well accepted depiction is. But if you take a look, in this depiction the the skin is more humanly manageable. This one I'm not not not, not, not so really because if you look at her, her skin's gray. And the this depiction has two statues on the floor. One's looking down and one's looking up at her. And the swords instead of going above her head, they look like they're going right through her. See that? That's just another. That's a different depiction. And as well, her gown is out of the bed, while this one's still in it. And then there's even. Another depiction I'm going to share, which is actually my favorite Nine of Swords depiction, and it's not like that one. See how completely different that is? And depending on usually what a depiction an artist does of a card, that changes like the whole card's perspective altogether. It, it still represents anxiety, nightmares, on all three accounts, it can. But as for me, personally, if, and this deck I'm using is Toro Apocalypse, well, well, for this example, for this card, is Toro Apocalypse. For this one, whenever I draw this card, it's a really positive card. Probably thinking, you, you like having night terrors? In this card depiction, there's there's to be two women in, in the picture, okay? But here's the little twist: the woman is the same figure. There's the head up there, and then there's another one behind her. But there's only one pure right figure. The dark is another figure altogether. Put them together. Well, if you can put two and two together, you get the light and then the dark. You have hell. And having hell be depicted in this card, once I figured it out and I saw it, well, that was a quick favorite card right off the bat. But also, in this card, unlike the other two, you have uh, the dark figure right there at the top of the chair. I'm going to try it. There we go. And it looks like she's screaming. And she's holding onto one of the swords. And if you look, 
It was like she's pointing at you in a way. And with her other hand, she looks like she's out trying to grab you. To me, saying that, that, that rather makes me feel like, oh good, that was nice to know that I'm being watched after and I need to get a move on and I need to get to it and do what I need to, what I'm supposed to be doing. Otherwise, she's going to be coming uh, screaming and yelling and about to go beside the head. For this one, there's not really any motivation or push. It's just like a sickly ill night terror kind of a feel for that one. And for this one, she looks more depressed than the other two. This one's more of a, like, uh, can't sleep because of sickness. This one's more like a, no, oh, I'm just so sad and depressed of a nine of swords. See how completely different that is? Another example. Probably the one that's the most obvious, in my opinion, is the lovers. We have the somewhat most commonly accepted image. We have the Adam and Eve figure, and oh my gosh, Satoshi, God forbid. And uh, the angel figure above, the mountain in the middle, separated on two sides. Okay. And then we have this depiction, which pretty much, in a way, is the same thing, just on the side. You have, well, in a way it would be the other way around like that, but you have the concept of masculine and feminine being split in the middle, being divided by something in the middle, or the stereotypical, yeah, if we all know when we hear lover. But they're actually, funny enough, really is not a depiction of a divine figure in between them on either side. And then we have the big curve ball. Wow. That changed the whole ball game, didn't it? Cause both of because both of these two have divine figures in them. There's an Archangel. There's a definitely not innocent Cupid. But here's here's the thing. This one only has two figures on the ground. This one has three. Hmm. This one, there is an indication of a choice to make. The guy is the one choosing between two. One is white, the other one is red. The white one is a figure who is pure and innocent. Uh, the other one is not showing her face all the way. And she looks like... Mm -mm, choice. And the guy is caught in between the middle to choose which one. And he had better make a choice quick, otherwise Cupid is just going to make the choice for him. And then he decides by just looking at one of them. So, in this depiction... Also, one is having her hands positioned behind her back, but not like she's tired, but just patient. And the other one is more like, really? You can't make a choice? See? It's kind of like the figure of the angel and the horned figure in a way, too. But the man has to make a decision which way to go. While we have as well this one, the Adam and Eve figure are well, one's going upward like that, and the other one is not really doing what is it's the Ray Ray Smith's depiction. The one is also having his hands out, but not looking up. The feminine figure is looking up, and then the thing in the middle is a mountain, not a 
man to make a choice, but the lover still has that choice aspect to it. But unlike the other one, the divine figure above the archangel is actually, in a way, look at it, it looks like he's opening it up and overseeing the two. One's looking up for advice and the other one's like, no, 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 I can't be listening to this. And then, well, it's not really a curveball, but I'm just going to call it a curveball. In this aspect, it's actually the masculine and feminine coming together into a medium joint point. So in a way, you can... In a way, you can say that this is the most fitting to overcome obstacle based on Earth and space. No matter what distance it is or how long it is, the two can come together as another example. Next one, after this one, I'll probably just do one that actually has a name, has a unique aspect to it. Okay, last but not least, regarding that, we have the Eight of Swords. First one. All right, we have typical depiction, except. Usually the typical depiction has her facing away from the sword, it's not facing inward. Then we have a guy who's being gagged and stuck like that, and having ravens fly around him. And then to me, this one's the curveball one. Now, judging by it, you're probably thinking, but isn't that the same one as this one? Nope. We'll go with the oddball one, I guess. Well, he's scared. He can see if he opens his eyes, but he can't move. So he's like pretty much going all... I know something's coming, but I can't do anything about it. I'm stuck. That's a completely different, different depiction than this one. Because this depiction right here, she doesn't look like she's like challenged or in trouble. She's stuck, but she's patient and at ease. Rather than like, oh god, get Murph and oh. She's just standing there and just being patient and relaxed. Now this out now the odd now this one is somewhat the same as the last one, but this one's different. All based on just how it's depicted. If you look, she's more coward into herself, but still bound and stuck. But look at her feet. If you look at her feet, it looks like she's moving. And the way that she's moving with her feet looks like she's actually dancing around while protecting herself. So she's on the move despite her not being able to see where she's going. She's still moving around despite the opposition. Some of taking the situation as it is and still going and rolling with it, not stopping. So, and also there are some decks that are out there that actually include a card that is usually not with the, the deck, like the regular standard 78 card deck. In fact, it has 79. And yeah, I know I can count. Some decks that actually do that, I have two of them. One being to Raw Apocalypse, one card is. They all gifted. Now with decks like that, you have something that is completely, most of the time, it depends on what the reader sees it as. The all gifted is at a depiction of Pandora. And whenever you hear Pandora, you think, oh, like her box of chocolates? Oh, it's true. I mean, 
You never know what you're gonna get. You open the box, it's totally nothing. Or you open the box and you made a hot mess for humanity to deal with. Lovely. Oh. Were they all gifted? Hmm. Pops up. One person can think, okay. Hmm. I don't know why she needs to even open the box. I mean, she looks well put together. She must have, you know, a lot of comfort wearing a kimono, it looks like. And she looks, she looks like she's not paying attention to what she's doing. She looks like, uh, so you can think, hmm, she must have, <clears throat> A lot of comfort, but stupid and doesn't listen. And it looks like the box is opening up. Not paying attention to what she's doing. Uh. And not listening. And come forth the hot mess. I mean, it, somebody else can look at this card and think of completely something different. That's the beauty of using the tarot. It's a divination tool that has a very difficult means of actually defining. Because what something means to someone else and what they see, someone can see the complete opposite. That's why a lot of people, me included, like to get a lot of decks. Not just because of only the colors, the collecting part, but each one speaks in a different language. It's still the language of intuition, but each depiction has a different tone, says different words, and speaks in a different dialect. Like for example, to Real Apocalypse, that's, that's a deck that's multi-cultural. Multi so what's depicted in one culture can't be, Ugh. While the other one's like, oh, okay. Each deck is different. Each thing says a different perspective and a different way of going about it. At least, that's how I like to look at it. On top of the, yes, I'll, I'll collect all the cards in the world or whatever. But primarily, my big reason is like, okay, if this deck's saying this, then what happens if we have the same reading be popped out with the same cards in the same position? to get a different insight because it's a different depiction in a different language. So, just something really to think about if you want to actually get into this lovely art that each deck has each deck speaks differently, speaks a different language, speaks in a unique way. So, consider that when Someone asks, why do you have so many decks? Don't they do the same thing? There are some people that use one deck for reading. Then there's one they use for magical. And then there are some people that actually just get it and they admire the artwork. You don't know. Everybody has their reasons of getting a deck. So, this is probably the first of a series I'll think about getting underway, like, okay, major arcana for the Tarot, like the standard edition. Well, here's this, Get, getting into it, but, and also, I'll go through like each, well, well, probably not each deck, but like a good general idea of what you're looking at, and how it's depicted in some other decks to see how the meaning can change just because of how somebody drew it. So. Ah, 